Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be returning to Texas in the 1990s to look at the unusual case of Cowboy Bob. In May 1991, at the American Federal Bank in Irvine, Texas, a man walked in wearing a brown leather jacket, cowboy boots, and a cowboy hat. His hair was starting to turn grey and he had a full beard. He was standing around 5 feet 10 inches tall and estimated to be in his mid-40s. There was very little to distinguish him from thousands of other bank customers in Texas at the time. However, this man was at the bank that day to commit a robbery. He kept his head down to avoid his face being caught on camera. He then approached the cashier and simply handed them a note stating, This is a bank robbery. Give me your money. No marked bills or die packs. The man was calm and collected and did not utter a single word. He checked the money for die packs and left the bank within minutes after he had arrived. As bank robbery is a federal crime, the FBI were called in to investigate. They discovered that the robber made his escape in a 1975 Orange Pontiac Grand Prix, but they soon realised that the licence plate was stolen. With no leads to follow, the investigation stalled. Seven months later, in December 1991, the same man parked his Orange Pontiac directly in front of the Savings of America Bank in Irvine and calmly walked inside. Once again, He demanded cash by handing the cashier a note and left again within minutes, this time approximately $1,200 richer. As the FBI followed up on the license plate of the Pontiac, they arrived at a house to find a startled lady sitting in her home, having no idea that her license plate from her red Chevrolet had been stolen earlier that day. The bank robber became known as Cowboy Bob, And other than the fact that he wore his cowboy hat backwards, the FBI had learnt nothing new about him since the first robbery. The following month, in January 1992, Cowboy Bob struck again. Parking directly outside of the Texas Heritage Bank in Garland, Texas, he stole several thousand dollars from the bank in a few minutes. Once again, the Pontiac had a stolen license plate and the investigation led nowhere. Steve Powell, a 20-year veteran of the FBI who specialised in catching bank robbers, was stumped. He was no closer to discovering the identity of Cowboy Bob. During every robbery, Cowboy Bob was meticulous in checking for die packs, was calm, never spoke and gave nothing away that could help in identifying him. In May 1992, Cowboy Bob approached the nation's bank in Mesquite, Texas. Carefully checking the money as it was handed over, he gave back the notes containing the die packs to the cashier, before once again making a speedy exit this time with over $5,000 in cash. After a break of around five months, Cowboy Bob approached the first Gibraltar bank in Mesquite and got away with just under $2,000. While the FBI were at the bank investigating this robbery, they received a call. Another robbery had already taken place, this time at the first interstate bank in Mesquite. When the cashier handed over the money, almost $14,000, a huge haul for Cowboy Bob, he tipped his hat to them before making his escape. Once again, the FBI tracked the license plate on the getaway car, but on this occasion they were shocked to find that the plate matched the description of the car for the first time. Could it be that in his haste to commit two robberies in the same day, Cowboy Bob had finally made a mistake? The orange Pontiac Grand Prix was registered to a man by the name of Pete Tallis. 52-year-old Pete worked at a Ford auto parts factory nearby. The FBI rushed to find Pete, believing that they had finally got their man. When interviewed, Pete confirmed that he did in fact own the Pontiac, but that he had given it to his mother, Helen, 
and sister Peggy Jo a year or so earlier as the two women were unable to afford a car of their own. Pete gave his mother and sister's address to the FBI. When they arrived at the address in Garland, Texas, the FBI found the Pontiac complete with the license plate used in the last robbery. It was parked in the car park at the apartment complex. As they were about to approach the apartment where Helen and Peggy Jo lived, a lady dressed in shorts and a t-shirt got into the Pontiac and drove out of the car park. Assuming that Cowboy Bob was still inside the apartment, some FBI agents followed this woman and pulled her over once they were out of sight. The lady identified herself as 48-year-old Peggy Jo Tallis. Peggy Jo told the FBI that she had taken the car out that morning to buy some fertilizer from a nursery and that she was the only one who had driven it. She also confirmed that the only person in the apartment at that time was her mother who was quite unwell. The agents repeatedly questioned Peggy Jo about whether she had a boyfriend or a friend who had access to the car, but she continued to tell them that she was the only one who drove it. They kept asking who she was protecting, but she continued to deny this. As the FBI performed a search of the apartment, they found the hat and jacket that had been worn during the robberies along with the firearm. They also found approximately $15,000 in cash and a fake beard. As the FBI agent Steve Powell continued to question Peggy Jo, he noticed white flakes starting to fall from her hair and a slight mark on her top lip. At that point he realised that Cowboy Bob was actually a woman and was in fact Peggy Jo. She was arrested and charged with bank robbery. Peggy Jo was 48 years old, having been born on the 6th of June 1944. She was the youngest of three children born to Pete and Helen Fay Tallis. Her father, Pete, died of cancer when she was just five years old and she grew up with her mother and siblings in a small rented house in the suburb of Grand Prairie, Texas. Peggy Jo did not do well in school and dropped out of high school after the 10th grade. However, she was popular and kind and had many friends. In her 20s, she moved to a small apartment and worked as a hotel receptionist at a Marriott Hotel in Texas. She had a great social life and would often be seen out and about in the bars and clubs in Dallas. She enjoyed life to the fullest, but also had a bit of a wild side. In the 1970s, she received five years probation for stealing a car during a night out. Peggy Jo never really cared about or was driven by money. She simply wanted enough to get by and dreamed of saving enough to live on a beach in Mexico. After having her heart broken by a man who she fell in love with and then discovered that he was married, she became wary of men and never really aspired to get married or have children. However, as the years passed, her dreams of Mexico and a life without responsibilities faded as her mother's degenerative bone disease and dependence upon her increased. It is believed that it was the cost of her mother's medicines which led Peggy Jo to commit her first bank robbery, although she never discussed her motives when she was questioned. Some who interviewed her during this time believe that whilst the cost of the medicine may have been her initial motivation, she subsequently became hooked on the thrill of robbing banks. Peggy Jo pleaded guilty and received a relatively lenient sentence of 33 months in federal prison. Perhaps this was because she never used any weapons during the robberies. Despite receiving lucrative book and film offers, she never told her story. Once she was released from prison, she moved, along with her mother, to a two-bedroom townhome in Garland, where she lived an anonymous life taking care of her mother. Peggy Jo got a job at a small marina complex nearby, where she was well-liked, respected, and made lots of friends. On the 18th of December 2002, her mother Helen died in her sleep at the age of 83. 
Her mother's death had a profound effect on Peggy Jo. She bought a recreational vehicle, or RV, sold the majority of her possessions, quit her job at the marina and decided that she would spend her life on the road. Less than two years later, in 2004, either for financial reasons or because she was once again craving the thrill, Peggy Jo is believed to have dressed as a man and robbed a bank in Tyler, East Texas. Just seven months later, on the 5th of May 2005, she returned to that same bank in order to rob it once again. This time, she parked her RV across the street from the bank and at around 11am walked inside. She had not donned her usual cowboy disguise, instead wearing all black with a straw hat and black gloves. Rather than handing over a note, she politely told the teller to hand over everything in their cash drawer. This was a total of around $11,000. Perhaps due to the size of the hall, or because she was out of practice, she forgot to check for dye packs, and as she left the bank, a dye pack hidden in the money exploded. There was red smoke and dye everywhere, and many witnesses saw what had happened. Peggy Jo ran across the seven lane road towards her RV to attempt to escape. By this time the robbery had already been reported multiple times and the police were on their way. The old RV did not make for a quick getaway vehicle and a low speed pursuit followed before Peggy Jo was boxed in by the police in a quiet housing estate just a few miles from the bank which she had robbed. The police were unaware of who or how many people were in the RV, so surrounded the vehicle with their weapons drawn. Meanwhile, Peggy Jo left the driver's seat and went into the back of the RV, drew the curtains before sitting at the small table and smoking a cigarette. The police called for her to leave the RV and hand herself in. Peggy Jo opened the back door of the RV and told them that she would not be going back to prison. Despite the police's best efforts to calmly resolve the situation, as she exited the vehicle, Peggy Jo raised a gun and four policemen simultaneously fired at her. She was killed instantly. Despite a loaded gun being found inside the RV, the weapon that Peggy Jo had pointed at the police was in fact a toy pistol. She never had any intention of anyone being physically hurt that day other than herself. That concludes today's story about Peggy Jo Tallis, also known as Cowboy Bob. Please remember to add any comments down below. I'll be interested in reading your thoughts on this case. This is the first recording since hitting the 50,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for your support, everybody. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. This story is currently being made into a film. Lily James is going to be the main star. Goodbye.